We have the opportunity right now with AI to make sure that every single student has exactly what they need. We're excited to launch ACE, our new AI-powered assistant. With ACE for Educators, we're making it faster and easier to integrate formative assessments into your course content with AI-powered questions. And ACE is not just for educators. ACE for Students gives AI-powered study assistance. Students can ask questions about what they're learning and ACE will provide a relevant response. And it knows the materials that you have access to. And so when you ask it a question, ACE knows exactly how to provide the answer that will be helpful to you. The future is bright. The future is exciting, right? The future is about making sure every single student has exactly what they need at the right moment. It's about really personalizing the experience for every single student so that they can realize their potential. And well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you're joining us from. Please feel free to put your, uh, introduce yourself into our chat. Uh, tell us where you're coming from. Uh, I'm Brad Cohen. I'm the Chief Academic Officer here at Top Hat, and I'm joining you from Minnesota, where winter is letting us know it's not quite through with us just yet. Uh, I am really thrilled to welcome you to our latest installment of Higher Learnings. The video you just saw offers a sneak peek of ACE, our AI-powered teaching and learning assistant, about which I'll have a little bit more to say, a timely plug given our topic for today. And you also saw Maggie Lean, who became our new CEO just a little over a week ago. There are a lot of exciting things happening at Top Hat these days, and we're pretty excited to share some of that with you. Uh, as always, we want this to be an engaging hour. Uh, so to make our time together as interactive as possible, please post your questions for our guest using the Q&A feature. Uh, we have quite a large group today, uh, but we'll try to get to as many of these as possible. We're also going to make liberal use of the chat feature, as you already are. I'm loving where everyone's coming from here. Uh, we're going to crowdsource some ideas, share some resources. Uh, so please uh, warm up your fingers. And rest assured, uh, we will be sharing both the recording of the presentation and the slides in our follow-up communications. AI has been a running theme for us and for much of higher ed for over a year now. And judging by the interest in our recent webinars, it shows no signs of abating. During our last session, we heard from Dr. James Lang on the steps educators can take to ensure academic integrity uh, in the age of AI. It was a hugely valuable session. And if you weren't able to attend, you can access that recording and many other higher learnings webinars uh, at our events page at Top Hat. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues will put that link into the chat for you here. Uh, this month, we are going to keep the learning going by focusing on options, strategies, and examples that you can use to reimagine your assignments and the course design decisions you make in the age of generative AI. If anything, this past year has shown us that AI can do so many things really well. As an educator, as educator and faculty consultant Jose Boner remarked, AI is fundamentally challenging our notion of average and what we should do, what we should be expecting students to do uh, as well as ourselves. Yet with every emerging technology, there's the hype and inevitably it's reality. You may have seen the recent Chronicle of Higher Education article in which Gary Smith and, Jerry, and Jeffrey Funk assert that when it comes to critical thinking, AI flunks the test. Large language models like ChatGPT are quite amazing at generating human, human language text. But ask these tools to defend a reasonable position or formulate a plausible hypothesis and things may start to break down. While AI has limits, it certainly challenges us to rethink some of the traditional course design choices that we make. And that may not be such a bad thing, especially if it means reimagining assignments that are more authentic and that foster critical thinking skills that help prepare students for the kind of work they will likely encounter after graduation. This is what our session today is all about. But before we introduce our, introduce our speaker, just a few more words about Top Hat. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Top Hat is the leading platform for student engagement used by thousands of faculty at more than 750 institutions across North America. Through automated attendance, interactive polls, quizzes, discussions, and a growing catalog of interactive texts, Top Hat enables instructors to embrace evidence-based teaching practices inside and outside the classroom. We also offer a number of features that we think will be of interest given our topic today. As you heard at the start of our session, we recently launched Top Hat ACE, a groundbreaking AI-powered assistant designed to create better teaching and learning experiences for you and your students. 
ACE makes it faster and easier to integrate frequent low stakes assessments to help you help bring the principles of active learning to your lecture presentations and course materials. With a click of a button, ACE generates questions with supporting hints and explanations, all based on the context of your course content. ACE uses in-context learning to analyze content as well as imagery to ensure accurate, high-quality recommendations. Questions generated by ACE can be edited by you or added directly to course material or presentations, reducing the time and effort required to incorporate active learning inside and outside the classroom. With ACE, we're making it easier for educators to increase the impact of their instruction and to make learning more fun and engaging. Because we know when we do this, more students will succeed. And ACE isn't just for educators. Students can also use ACE for personalized study support without ever having to leave the learning experience within Top Hat. When students need help outside of class, they can ask ACE a question about what they're learning, and ACE will provide a relevant response that is drawn from the context of your course material. It can help clarify and summarize information and even provide guidance to help students study for tests and exams. Lastly, I'd like to touch on Top Hat Pages, our content authoring and customization tool. With Top Hat Pages, you can reimagine readings and assignments by incorporating multimedia, video, and images, as well as knowledge checks and a variety of different assessment questions. This is just one of the many ways we enable you to create learning experiences that are current, inclusive, and that align perfectly with your course objectives. We'll be launching a poll toward the end of our program and you can request follow-up uh, if you're interested in learning more about these features. With that, it's time to introduce our speaker. I am absolutely thrilled to welcome author, educator, faculty consultant, and yes, the host of Intentional Teaching Podcast, Dr. Derek Bruff. Derek is the former director uh, for teaching at Vanderbilt University and the author of Intentional Tech, Principles to Guide the Use of Educational Technology in College Teaching. He also consults regularly with faculty and administrators on course design and improving student success. Derek, it's a genuine pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, I'm gonna to turn the presentation over to you to, uh, to drive as we go forward here. All right, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Let me take the presentation. Great, thank you, Brad. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, so it's been a, bu a busy couple of years, uh, year and a half for uh, someone like me who spends a lot of time thinking about teaching with technology. Um, I work with faculty in a range of disciplines, uh, thinking through uh, course design and teaching decisions. Um, but I have a real interest in educational technology. And so when um, ChatGPT uh, hit the scene about a year and a half ago, it, it, it changed things a lot. Um, I, I, I could say a lot about that. Um, but I don't want to dig too deep into how these tools work, but I do want to echo a couple of things, echo and reinforce a couple of things that that Brad said um, about kind of how these tools work and, and what they're good for. Um, I like to say that tools like ChatGPT speak, but don't think. Uh, these large language models have been trained on amazingly large sets of data, particularly text drawn from all over the internet. And they have analyzed that text to see which words are likely to follow other words. That's a kind of some, that's a bit of a simplification, but that's the main idea actually. And so they're really good at stringing together words in sensible ways. And I mean that quite literally, like ways that make sense to humans. Um, but they don't think in any kind of traditional manner. Um, and as Brad mentioned, when you when you ask them to do things like critical thinking and argument analysis, your mileage may vary, right? And so I think this is an important thing to remember. Um, I'll also often say uh, these tools are wordsmiths, they're not oracles. And so I think um, there was a lot of conversation around ChatGPT and the other tools early on where, um, well, one, we can ask them to answer the types of short answer or essay questions that we often give our students, and they will they will perform reasonably well at those types of tasks. Um, and I think that's what drove a lot of the angst in higher ed when these tools were announced is because the kind of assessments that we use routinely um, it looks like ChatGPT can handle those assessments fairly well, but um, because they're just stringing together words in sensible ways and they don't actually know anything, um, I don't think of them as a place to go and get answers for stuff. I think of them as a, as a way to work with words differently. Um, and I think that's a, a useful kind of metaphor or lens to keep in mind as we think about using these tools in teaching and learning. And um, to kind of drill down a little bit more. So the image you see here, I created using an AI image generator called Midjourney. I asked it for a robot weaving together words like a giant tapestry, which was the idea that I wanted to try to convey here. Um, 
And I think it's interesting that um, there has been a lot of conversation around chat GPT and the text generators about getting things wrong and hallucinating information. Um, but I wouldn't ha ha ask that type of question of an image generator, right? Did, did Midjourney get this prompt right or wrong? I don't know. It's a robot weaving together words like a giant tapestry. I don't know what that's supposed to look like, right? So I think if we think of these as more um, creative or even perhaps playful tools, it can help us get a better sense of what they're good at and what they're not good at and find ways to integrate them into our teaching and our students' learning. So with that, I've got my first poll for you all. I'm curious to know kind of what your experience using ChatGPT and other AI tools is. Um, have you not tried any of them um, or maybe played around a little bit? Maybe you use them occasionally for work purposes or, or maybe they're now part of your regular workflow. Um, and so I'll give you just a few seconds to respond to that. And I, I can't actually see the responses coming in right now. So I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting the results here. I am a little curious. I, I've asked this question in many settings over the last year, and I've slowly seen a shift towards the bottom half of the answer choices. All right. Okay, so um, I think we can all see the results now. 11% of you said you haven't tried any of them. Um, I would suggest that as soon as we're done here today that you go to ChatGPT and just start poking around. Um, it'll take five minutes and you'll get a real concrete sense of what uh, these tools can do. Um, most of you have at least played around a little and several of you have made them part of your regular workflow. And that's something I would encourage you to share in the chat as we go. Um, uh, how are you using these tools on a regular basis? Um, I'd be curious to know that. So let's talk a little bit about learning objectives in light of these generative AI tools, whether it's text generators or image generators or some other tools. And I'm going to do that by way of a story from, I think, 2014. <laughs> so I was teaching a linear algebra course that year. Um, and this new tool uh, was released called Wolfram Alpha. It was a web-based tool with a simple little box where you could type in math questions. Um, this is not AI. This is an actual computational engine that was uh, released by Wolfram at the time. But it was really easy to use, and you could you could give it a math question, and it would compute stuff. It 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 did think in a sense, right? It would it would actually answer your math questions. And the way this intersected with my linear algebra course is that there's a category of questions that I would ask in linear algebra, where essentially I've got a word problem for students, and I need them to model that situation with something called a matrix rows and columns of numbers. They would then take that matrix and do a series of arithmetic operations on the matrix called row reduction. And these operations were tedious, they were error prone, and they took a fair amount of time. But when they finished that, they would have a new form of that matrix. And that would be essentially the answer to their question, but they would have to interpret those numbers in light of the original word problem. And so they had this kind of three-step structure to these questions and model the situation with the matrix, do this long, tedious computation called row reduction, and then interpret the results in light of the, the original context. Well, Wolfram Alpha can row reduce matrices much faster and much more accurately than I can, let alone my students. And so what I did was I changed my exams that semester. I let my students use Wolfram Alpha on their exams. They still had to model the situation with their matrix, but then they could type that matrix into Wolfram Alpha, have it do the tedious computations and come back with an answer that they then had to interpret. And what this meant, among other things, was instead of a, like a 25 minute test question that was mostly tedious computation, this would be like a five to seven minute test question that was much more conceptual and applied in nature. And so because of this particular tool, I was able to shift the focus on my learning objectives away from some of the rote computation and more towards concepts and applications. And I think we're starting to see similar moves in light of generative AI. So I'm going to quote John Warner here. Um, he's been writing a lot about AI and writing. Certainly our writing instructor colleagues have kind of had to be on the front line of this change. Um, he wrote a book called uh, Why They Can't Write, Killing the Five Paragraph Essay and Other Necessities. And he blogged pretty early in this process. He said, part of the problem is that we have been conditioned to reward surface level competence, like fluent prose, with good grades, C plus, B minus, or B. We may have to get used to not rewarding pro forma work that goes through the motions with passing grades, 
or it may mean finding other elements of the experience to focus on in terms of grading. Not unlike Brad shared that quote from Jose Bowen, right? Average may change now <laughs> because of what these tools can do. And so it may be that we need to focus on other learning objectives in writing instruction or in coding, right? Um, one of the things that folks discovered pretty early on with these AI models that were trained on large parts of the internet, is there's a lot of computer code on the internet. And so just as they're good at putting words together, they're good at writing computer code. And they're, they're, they are pretty good. Pretty much any assignment you would encounter in a first or second semester computer science course, um, ChatGPT and its other tools can handle that type of assignment. And so what does that mean for um, coding instruction? Well, Brett Becker and colleagues wrote a white paper in 2022. They were also on the front line because this, this coding phenomenon came out before ChatGPT was released. And they wrote, we believe this minimally suggests a shift in emphasis towards code reading and evaluating rather than code generation. So maybe we can change how we teach some of these introductory program courses where we're making sense of code that's written by others, which is a useful skill in industry anyway, right? Most large coding projects are are written by lots of people. And so um, this may mean a change in our learning objectives. But we also might keep some learning objectives even though AI can shortcut the work. So I'm gonna go a little bit into another category of AI. This is not generative AI, large language models. This is um, kind of a pattern recognition form of AI. I'm a bird watcher and um, I enjoy going on hikes and walks and looking for new birds that I haven't seen before. And there's an app on my phone that's made by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's called Merlin. And it's pretty good at using AI to identify birds by their sounds. So I can go in my front yard and I can open up the app and it will listen. And it will say, I think I hear a yellow-throated warbler. And then I'll take my, my camera and I'll try to find the warbler in the front yard, right? So it's, it's pretty accurate, right? Um, it's not 100%, um, but it's good enough for my purposes. So, um, I reached out to someone who teaches bird identification to kind of see what her what she thought about this app. So I talked to Margaret Rubega. She is a biology professor at the University of Connecticut. She is Connecticut State Ornithologist, and she teaches uh, lots of courses about birds, including bird identification. And I asked her, would you allow your students to use an app like Merlin as part of their course? And she said, absolutely not. <laughs> The goal is for students to gain skills to advance their careers as professional field biologists. When the bird identification you are doing is data, it's important for you to be able to reach an ID for yourself and to have a sense of how certain, which is to say uncertain you are about the identification. Her students need to learn how to identify birds themselves, right? And so Merlin may play a role in that, but she is worried that using the AI in this case would shortcut the learning that students really need as professional field biologists. And so in her course, <coughs> she doesn't allow the use of these types of tools um, because it's not appropriate for learning objectives, right? Um, I will also say that in her case, she teaches smaller courses and upper level courses where this is relevant, where it's a little easier to make the case to students that they need to learn these skills and not rely on the technology. Here's another example, and I've said this many times over the last year, expert AI use requires expertise. So um, this example is actually from my wife, Emily Bruff. She's a marketing manager for Zondervan Academic. Um, and she was marketing this book called Know the Theologians uh, that's coming out this year. And she wanted to create some kind of swag for the pre-orders. And she wanted theological the, theologian trading cards, right? And so these are some of the theologians mentioned in this book, right? And so she, she, she went to the AI tool that she was using at her company, and she started prompting it to try to generate images of particular theologians, some of whom we know what they look like, and others we just kind of know when and where they lived, right? And so, <laughs> as she said, I interviewed her for my podcast, and she said, AI doesn't think women are theologians, apparently. <laughs> so she was telling me there's a, a group of theologians called the Cappadocian Four, um, from like the fourth or fifth century. Um, and if you ask AI for a, a, a depiction of four theologians from the fifth century, it won't give you a woman, right? Um, it also didn't nail other details, right? So um, more recently, um, there were theologians who had particular um, things to wear or ways that they would do their hair or glasses or not glasses, right? These were all kind of details. Some details were very important actually to the depiction of these theologians. 
And so my wife, Emily, was kind of constantly taking the output from AI and running it by the authors of this book to see what it had gotten right and what it had not gotten right. And so I think it's a great illustration of this point that expert AI use requires expertise. And in her case, she had some expertise in art that allowed her to kind of give uh, feedback to the AI, but she really needed the expertise of the authors in this case um, to really refine this and, and get what she wanted. Uh, by way of converse, right, novice, like if you're a novice in a particular field and you're using AI, you're not going to get much better than novice results. And so in many of our courses, there is still a need to teach students the skills they will need, even if they're using AI, they may be using those skills to evaluate the output of AI and make it actually work for whatever problem they're trying to solve. So here's our next poll, because I'm curious to know where you land in terms of your use of AI in your teaching. How would you describe your policy on generative AI right now? Are you a red light? Are you prohibiting the use of AI in your courses? Are you a yellow light? Are you permitting the use of AI with limitations? Are you a green light? You're all excited and you're, you're eager to see what AI can do. Or are you a flashing light? You're still not sure about what your policy should be. We'll take a second and weigh in on that polling question. And again, I'm very curious. I've been asking this question for a year now. The last two times I asked it, there were no red lights in the room. Those were much smaller rooms though. So we'll see what we get here. All right. All right, so we have some red lights. About 10% of you are still prohibiting. And again, that may be the right choice for your course, right? I don't, I'm not saying there's a better choice here. Um, I, there's a lot of variables at play here. Uh, many of you are in the yellow light category, 35%. 26% um, are you in the green light. Oh, and almost a third of you are not sure what you're doing yet. That's okay too, right? That is, again, no wrong answers here. Um, at this point, I'm going to see if Brad has a, a question or comment or two from the chat that he'd like to share. We we do we do, Derek. So um, so uh, maybe keying off the the last point we're making about um, keeping some learning objectives despite the fact that uh, that uh, AI may be able to do this work for a student. Um, you you mentioned having to justify that. The question is really, do you have some advice on how to engage students in this? Like, what's the way forward with students who may think this is just silly? There's a technology solution that does this for me. Why why do I have to go through this? How do you start that conversation? How do you have success with it? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm reminded of many conversations I've had with math faculty over the years about calculators, right? Like, like when, when is, where do you draw the line? When, when is it uh, a crutch and when is it useful? Um, I think the number one response is to be really transparent with your students about this and to have those conversations. I think that's super important. Um, uh, and if you're, you know, if you're a red light and you're prohibiting the use, I think you need to talk to your students about why you're doing that. Um, and probably, again, talk to them regularly, right? Anything you put in the syllabus needs to be repeated multiple times in the course. Um, but also invite their feedback and, and their ideas, right? Um, I think that's super important as well. I think, you know, um, I mentioned the, the case of Margaret Rebecca preparing professional uh, field uh, uh, ornithologists, right? And so if you have a group of students who know why they're taking your course and what they're hoping to get out of it and where they're going with it professionally, you're in a much better position to be able to say, look, these are the skills that you're actually going to need. Um, and, and maybe show them some uses of AI where, um, like with my wife's example, it did a pretty good job, but you really needed some expertise to refine it and make it work better. And you may find, and I think a lot of folks in many professions are finding this, is that, yeah, there are certain parts of their job that are now go a lot faster because AI can do some of the lifting. But um, you may have seen this go around social media. There was a, a journal article that was published, I think, last week. Um, and one of the captions for the figures uh, involved some clearly AI-generated language, right? It was one of those uh, AI caveats where it's like, I cannot answer this question because of my programming, right? And they included it in the paper they submitted to the journal. The journal editors didn't catch it, right? Like this is a whole terrible situation, but you're still responsible for what you submit to a journal, right? You're still responsible for the work products that you, you produce as part of your jobs. And so um, you need that expertise 
in order to evaluate the, the output of these, these tools and to do something useful with them. Or even to go back and forth, right? Like my wife, she had to kind of reprompt the thing again and again to get just the right hat on this particular bishop from the 12th century, right? Um, and so those are the types of, our, uh, of statements I, I think I would share with students is to try to kind of help them understand how the skills that you're teaching them are actually gonna serve them well in the long run. Um, and maybe make some space for them to push back a little bit and say, but what about this and what about that? I think the faculty last year who had open conversations with their students navigated this terrain a lot better than the ones who just kind of put down a wall and said, any use of AI is cheating. Um, it's too new. Um, and I think the students need to have that dialogue in order to make sense of what role it might play in their career. Maybe one more question before we move forward on, on a learning objective specifically. Um, the, the, what you're recommending here is really to either upgrade or in some cases preserve with you know a defense of sorts or a conversation of sorts, uh, learning objectives that you might already have. Is it important, do you, do you think, to also entertain explicitly AI-focused objectives as a necessary part of our course designs going forward? I think so. And it'll depend a lot on the course and the, the discipline that you're in. Um, this is one of those things I realized um, last August, like our students may know more about this than, than we do because they've been working all summer or doing internships where they're seeing how these tools are used in the workplace. And so I think that's something really to keep in mind is to figure out where are these tools being used in kind of places your students might land and try to find those connections. Um, I do think, you know, if I've got a room full of engineers, I'm going to teach them how to use certain software in order to help them be better engineers. And so um, now uh, I think there are a set of tools that are going to show up pretty much in any discipline that involves words, <laughs> which is basically all of them, right? And so I think it's incumbent on us to kind of see where um, AI is changing um, kind of how things are done uh, in our disciplines and in the professions that we're preparing students for. And then to try to kind of work that into our courses in thoughtful ways. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have <laughs> more questions and some themes in the chat, but I think they're anticipating what's coming up. So let's uh, move forward and we'll pull those forward at the end here. Okay, great. So how might we use AI to enhance learning, um, even towards maybe some traditional goals? And so um, here I've got another kind of uh, analogy of sorts. I am a bird watcher. I'm also a photographer. And so this is a photo of me that my wife took on a bird walk recently. And there's me with my camera trying to track down a tanager or something. Um, and I, I was thinking about how I learned photography years ago. And there was a kind of conceptual piece to learning photography about light and framing and composition and focus. But there's also a very kind of mechanical piece where I have all these buttons and knobs on my camera and I need to figure out um, what they do, right? And how I can do interesting things with them. And I would argue that when I was learning photography, the more I learned about the conceptual stuff, the more informed I was about the buttons and knobs on my camera, but vice versa. The more I experimented with my camera and saw what those different knobs were doing, the more that informed my conceptual understanding of photography. And so what I'm kind of looking for are where are the places in our in our teaching where the AI can serve that camera-like role, where playing around with the AI may help our students move towards some of the more conceptual understanding that we're after. And so I think we're starting to see some things kind of shake out as some practical strategies here. Um, one is that AI can help with the blank page. Uh, so uh, many students uh, struggle at the start of some type of project, um, and once they get going, they're good to go. Many of us struggle in the same way, right? And so um, I talked to one of my colleagues at the University of Mississippi, Guy Kruger, in writing and rhetoric. He was one of our on one of our panels this year, and he said, "Since we have been using AI, I've had several students prompt the AI to write an introduction or a few sentences just to give them something to look at beyond the blank screen." Sometimes they keep all or part of what the AI gives them. Sometimes they don't like it and they start to rework it, in effect, beginning to write their own introductions. And I think this is really interesting because it's not that the students just took what the AI wrote and started, you know, using it. Um, but sometimes they did and sometimes they rewrote it and sometimes they threw it out and started from scratch again, right? But it was a way, a kind of catalyst for these students to get going in their writing process. And so I think for some students in some cases, this can be a really useful 
uh, application of these uh, text generators. AI can help make sense of the reading. Um, so I took a, a PDF of a journal article I had handy um, on active learning and science courses, and I threw it over to ChatGPT, and I said, please generate a 500-word summary of the attached article, and it did a pretty good job of doing that, right? And so, and I'm going to say, right, so I, I'm I'm of the age where in high school we had Cliff's Notes, um, and so if I didn't want to do the reading, I could, I could use uh, Cliff's Notes to try to kind of get the gist of it. Um, that's maybe not the ideal use case, right? Um, but... On the other hand, the intended use of Cliff's Notes was to actually help you make sense of the reading, right? When we give our students really hard stuff to read, which we often do because learning is hard, right? They may need some assistance in making sense of that. And so a summary, I will say, um, and, and let's be honest, right? How many times do we read an entire journal article ourselves, right? In our fields, right? We're looking at the abstract. We're looking at the conclusions. We're jumping around, right? So reading it top to bottom is not necessarily what we do anyway. And so if AI, again, as a good wordsmith, can generate a summary, I found this summary more enlightening than the abstract that came with this article, right? And again, expert use requires expertise, right? I'm applying my expertise here, but if I'm encountering a new reading, I might use some AI to help me make sense of it um, a little bit faster. Um, and here I'll mention uh, Top Hat's ACE again as a tool that can be trained on the readings and the material in your courses and can play this role in pretty significant ways as we saw in that video earlier, um, helping students generate outlines or summaries or questions that can help them make sense of the reading. Again, these tools are pretty good with words. So these are the types of tasks that they're actually pretty decent at. If they've if they've got an, actually a, a text to analyze and summarize, it's the tools are gonna do a pretty good job of that most of the time. Now, AI can also provide some targeted feedback. And I wanna imagine a kind of simple version of this assignment that I'm gonna share. And then the one that Perry Fasihi at Boston University actually used. Um, the simple one would be a student writes an essay and goes to ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot or Google Gemini and says, give me some feedback, right? How can I make this better, right? That could be useful, but that's a pretty open-ended question that can go in a lot of different directions. What if instead we ask ChatGPT or one of these other tools to review the draft based on specific criteria? So give your students some prompts they can use with the AI. So have, ask ChatGPT, evaluate the evidence used to support the main argument. Is the evidence relevant, sufficient, and effectively integrated into the argument? Or maybe something more specific to the assignment itself. How well does the paper analyze the implications of digital technology on academic integrity and authorship? What insights or unique perspectives does the paper provide? And again, these tools speak but don't think. They're not necessarily going to give the highest quality, most accurate feedback but they are pretty good with words. And so they're going to give something useful here. And again, don't just take it at face value, but have your students reflect on what they're seeing, what they're getting. Write a run paragraph reflection on what you learned from the interaction, what you're changing about paper, what you're decided to keep. This, I think, is a nice example of what I was talking about with the camera um, and the conceptual learning, right? Like I'm using the tool to explore particular elements of this task uh, and get some useful feedback that I can then think about and respond to, not just take verbatim, but make some sense of. And our students may need help with those prompts, right? That's the part that they don't know yet of what needs to be worked on. So we can help them by providing those prompts. And then a tool like ChatGPT can provide lots of feedback using good prompts. A couple of more examples. AI can provide examples to critique. Um, so I saw, um, I've got a tip of the hat here to Robert Talbert, a math colleague of mine who posted this on social media last year. Um, he was planning his course and he, he, he was playing around with uh, Google Bard, which is now called Google Gemini. And he said, how many ways can you choose two dozen donuts when there are eight kinds available? This is a very math course kind of question, right? Um, and one of the things that I find re really entertaining about the Google AI, which is again now called Google Gemini, is that you can have it give you different drafts of an answer which is kind of comical for a math question. <laughs> so this is one draft answer to this question about donuts. Jim and I came up with two other answers. Um, the answers ranged from 25 to some astronomically large number, <laughs> right? And so Robert's idea was instead of asking students to solve this question, one could ask students to 
ask Google Gemini this question and then evaluate the quality of the results, right? And so this I've seen in many courses now from theology courses to history courses to nursing courses where you have the tool output something um, and then have the students critique the output. And again, if you've given them some guidance as to what they should be looking for, this is a great learning opportunity. It's nice that every student can have their own kind of lousy answer to critique and evaluate. Um, and so it's a really great opportunity for practice and feedback around particular skills. <coughs> Finally, in this section, I wanna say that AI can help read the room. And so this is something I've been experimenting with late, lately. I'm a big fan of classroom response systems and interactive polling in class, right? Have been for a long time. Um, one of the challenges is that if you're asking a multiple choice question, you get a bar graph and you can very quickly assess kind of where your students are with that question as we've been doing here today. If you ask a free response question, it's harder to get a sense of a lot of student responses all at once, right? And so one thing that I've tried out a few times now with some success is to ask a, uh, a, a question that invites kind of a sentence level response. This was, I did something at a, um, uh, this was a conference session for psychology teachers. And I was asking them, what strategies have you found useful for broadening student participation in your courses? And so then I copied those responses and pasted them into ChatGPT and asked ChatGPT to give me a summary of the main trends in those responses. And again, as a wordsmith, this is something it's pretty good at. If you give it a document, it's going to analyze and summarize it pretty, pretty accurately. I got four categories from this. I asked the teachers in the room, who has a comment that's not reflected in one of these four categories? And no one put their hand up, right? ChatGPT had done a pretty good job here summarizing this. And so I think this is a really interesting addition to my arsenal of classroom engagement techniques so that I can pull my students and then put that into ChatGPT or some other tool and very quickly get some useful summary that I can use to launch a discussion after the polling question. Speaking of polling questions, I would like you to go to the chat now. We're gonna do a ready, set, go question. I haven't actually been looking at the chat because there are 522 of you here. Um, so this is gonna be a little bonkers. I'm gonna pull up the chat right now. Where's my chat button? There it is, okay. So um, stop typing in the chat. I'm gonna draw a line here, okay? Your question is, this is a ready, set, go question. So I want you to compose your response in the chat, but don't hit enter until I say go, all right? So if you've been using AI in your teaching, what's one way you have used AI to enhance student learning? If you have not, then what's one way that you would like to explore? Okay, so try to be as concrete and specific as you can here. I'll give you about 20 seconds to compose something. Again, don't hit enter until I say go, and then it'll be bonkers. And, and Derek, just while we're waiting for everyone to compose and before you say go, um, we're getting a lot of questions about capturing this chat. Um, Zoom does not make this easy for us. So we are going to do our best to uh, um, provide some kind of summary uh, based on our own efforts behind the scenes here to, to provide uh, some sort of capture of this conversation. It's always so rich when we have the uh, Higher Learning we uh, webinar series. So if you're able to uh, click on links, then you know you can open those in your window and save them later. Um, a lot of the content here, though, is very difficult to capture directly. It doesn't make it easy to export and, and, and save and share, but we'll do our best for you. Okay, this is really comical with this many people. Someone always hits go, hits enter before I say go. And with 500 of you, several of you have done this, and now there's a whole conversation about not going yet. So ready, set, go. Hit enter if you have not done so already. <sighs> While you've been talking, that's what I've been experiencing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, what I'm not going to do this live in front of you because I, I want to I get to another topic here. But one thing we might do, Brad, is actually take this set of responses, copy and paste them into ChatGPT and do some summary. Um, uh, I have not used this technique with this many people in the past. Um, <laughs> Natalie says, you did this to yourself, Derek, yes. So this ready, set, go technique is a little bit more manageable when you've got 20 or 30 people. Um, but again, if you pair it with some AI analysis, you can kind of go bigger. Um, but I hope you're seeing, if nothing else in the chat, that there's a lot of opportunity to be creative here. Um, these tools are versatile and flexible. They, they, they have roles to play in lots of different disciplines. It's one of the reasons I like a good polling question uh, pedagogically, because you can do that in any class and it can find some utility, right? Um, 
And so there's a lot happening here. Um, I'm going to stop talking for a minute, Brad. See if you if you have any questions or comments you want to pitch to me before I I, I move into our our little third segment here. You're muted, Brad. Okay. Uh, one thing that's coming up um, is really around um, managing the the dynamism of this moment. Uh, it's come up in a variety of different ways. Like, is there a particular tool that's that's better for particular uses? Do you expect convergence? Um, uh, divergence in in tool sets. Um, there are questions about standards. Do you know how are we going to possibly you know maintain relevancy with standards that are imposed you know professionally in light of the pace of this change? Um, uh, the, the you know the current limitations are going to be obsolete uh, in the next uh, generation of of LLM. So, do you have some recommendation for how folks can can navigate this change? Um. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, on your, uh, director uh, experience. Yeah. Um, hold on. Let me get my button back. So one thing I was going to point out, and I think now's a good time to do it, is that there are some in inequities here, right? So um, ChatGPT has a regular version and a paid version called ChatGPT+. Plus, um, and ChatGPT+, Plus is not free. I think it's still $20 or so in the United States. Um, and so some of the things I've said today that ChatGPT can do, really only the paid version of ChatGPT can do, right? And so I think and to answer your question about kind of the platforms, I expect this category of tool to um, grow in use in a variety of, of areas. I expect certain vendors, certain companies, certain tools to encounter various problems that keep them from going forward, right? So will we have a chat GPT in a year? I don't know, probably given their financial investment, but who knows, right? There may also be some legal um, uh, uh, judgments that mean that certain companies have to pivot in certain directions, but I don't expect this tool set to go away, even if particular tools may kind of transform over time. Um, they do transform really fast. This has been something that's been kind of bonkers because you know, a year ago, I was saying to folks, well, ChatGPT hasn't been trained on anything past the year 2021. So you can just ask about current events and ChatGPT can't help your students. Well, that limitation went away a while ago, right? Now it can search the internet and, and teach itself anything from recent events that it needs to. Um, there's another tool called Illicit that um, is really good at searching scholarly journal articles and kind of finding patterns and finding things that might match your queries. Um, it changed its business model in the middle of the fall semester. And so faculty who were using it in August found themselves kind of in a quandary by October when students now had to pay for that kind of thing. And so this is a frustration, right? Um, and it's changing rapidly. I would say there are some folks I keep my eye on, right? Um, and some of these names um, you guys probably already know, but thinking about kind of who's following this situation. Mark Watson is one of my favorites at the University of Mississippi. He's got a great newsletter to follow. Um, he always knows more than I do about the particular technologies and how they're changing. So I would try to, if you're really invested, find a couple of folks who are spending more time on this than you are and see what they're saying about things to keep up. Um, so that's kind of one part of the answer. Um, I think, you know, this is frustrating because uh, we often don't have to respond this quickly to kind of curricular changes. I think computer science has done that pretty regularly over the last 30 years. As the programming language changes, as the standards of computer science change, they are always overhauling their curriculum. Most disciplines don't have to do that on such a regular basis. Um, but I do think we're at a moment where we, we need to be kind of playing around with that. And so, um, you know, and that doesn't mean changing the entire curriculum, but I do, I do think it means thinking about in my courses, where are these tools? What are some tools? Um, and where they might kind of intersect. Um, and I'll, I'll say this again a little bit later, but like you might have to fool around or, or experiment with some of these tools to kind of see um, how they're changing. I do think, um, again, uh, trying out some tools is important and talking to your students about this is important because they'll probably know stuff that you don't know and it'll be a nice way to kind of keep pace with what's, what's changing. Great. Uh, let's keep moving forward and, and uh, return to questions. So I want to end up, my last few slides are about kind of revising assignments in light of these new AI tools, right? And so this is one common response that I hear is that we might have to tweak our assignments. Um, uh, you know, we might make bigger changes to our courses, um, but uh, if nothing else, we need to rethink some of our assignments and what role AI might play in them. I want to share a quick example from one of my courses. 
Um, this was a statistics course that I taught several times. And over time, I started adding an infographics project to this course. So the students were asked to find some data set that they thought was interesting, do some basic statistical analysis on that data set, and then visualize their results in an engaging infographic. And so there's a little bit of kind of storytelling and aesthetic piece here, but it's mostly about data visualization and how can we, how can we do that in effective ways. And so um, I, uh, I, I wondered what, intercept what might AI do with an assignment like this, right? And so um, this is where the experimentation comes in. So one of the things that you might not know is that ChatGPT, the paid version, can visualize data for you. So I gave it an Excel file that had some data from the um, movie website Rotten Tomatoes. So it was a whole bunch of movies released in 2013, and it had uh, critic reviews and audience review numbers for each of these movies. I just gave it this Excel file and ChatGPT was able to ascertain kind of the nature of this file just from the headings that I gave it, which was pretty impressive. Um, it, and then I asked it to visualize the data. And so it gave me a distribution of user ratings for all these movies and a distribution of critic ratings for all these movies. <coughs> but of course, I really want a scatter plot comparing these two, right? That's the interesting question. So I asked it for that, right? And it did this very quickly. And I share this not because these are sophisticated data visualizations, or they're not even that hard to do, but if I needed to create a scatter plot for this data in Excel or R or some statistics package that I use only occasionally, it's going to take me an hour to figure out where all the buttons are, right? To, to, I'm going to have to do some research to do this. ChatGPT does it with a simple prompt. Um, and so I think this is kind of a powerful use. ChatGPT under the hood is actually writing and executing code to follow through these commands. And so it's got some pretty sophisticated data visualization options that I can access through just plain language prompts. Gemini, the Google product, um, is pretty decent at analyzing data visualizations. You can give it an image of a data visualization and ask it to tell you about it. And so I said, what can you tell me about this particular data visualization? And it did a pretty good job. I knew what it was, right? Um, <coughs> It tells me kind of what I'm looking at and tries to make some analysis. It's not perfect, certainly, um, but it did a pretty good job. I was I was impressed at this, right? It's not running off of a lot of information here. It also tried to fact check some of its results. So that sentence that's kind of highlighted in, in orange is where there seemed to be a conclusion in the data visualization that it could fact check using its search engine. And so it tried to do that for me, right? Which I think is an interesting move. Um, and then finally, I went to Claude, which is another AI tool. Um, and this actually gets at the access point a little bit. So, um, well, let me explain this and then I'll, I'll circle back to that question you asked a little bit earlier, Brad. Um, so I asked Claude kind of in the abstract, if I wanted to create an infographic comparing pizza prices at restaurants in a particular county with income level information for that county, what might I show in that infographic and how would I organize that visually? And I gotta say Claude's response was, quality. <laughs> so this on the left is an actual infographic that some of my students submitted um, uh, several years ago. On the right is Claude's response. Pretty much everything the students did is mentioned somewhere in Claude's kind of outline of what should go in this. And Claude had a few good ideas that the students didn't implement, right? So I can imagine a student who is trying to figure out what needs to go in this infographic. If I start with Claude, I've got a nice kind of menu of things that I'm going to need to work on through this project. And so there's some real utility here. And the quick sidebar about kind of the tool set, right, is there are lots of tools. It's not just ChatGPT. There's a lot out there. Some of them are very special purpose. Some of them are very general purpose. They do seem to be changing a lot, right? But they're all getting a little bit better. Um, and so I would say that, you know, I think I've heard that the free version of Claude is a little sharper than the free version of ChatGPT, right? And so if you're concerned about access, this is especially a reason to kind of explore what some of the other tools are. Um, I know at Mississippi, we already have a site license for Microsoft products. And so the Microsoft Copilot is available to everyone, the paid version. And so there may be some tools that are already paid for in your campus that you can look into. But in terms of this infographic assignment, I don't want you to read all this, it's too much, but these are the learning objectives I have for this assignment. And the ones highlighted in yellow are the ones where I think there's an AI tool that can be useful to some degree. So in other words, most of the learning goals um, there's a role for AI to play in this. And so I had to think about what would I change about this assignment in light of AI? One is I need to decide to teach statistics with AI. I already teach statistics with a lot of other technologies. Adding AI to the mix was an easy one. 
So this is the kind of red light, yellow light, green light level decision, right? So at some point you're gonna have to decide, are we gonna lean into AI or are we gonna say, no, this is a place where we don't, we shouldn't use it because it's gonna shortcut the learning. I'm gonna need to teach those AI tools. So we're gonna do some in-class activities. We're gonna do some low stakes outside of class assignments where they learn to use some of these tools and experiment with them in different ways. And I give them some feedback on that, right? I can't just assume they know how to use these tools. I'm gonna use some class time for structured peer review of drafts of these infographics. And so, you know, I have a bit of a luxury here. <clears throat> I typically teach this course in person and we meet for three hours a week and I have class time where I can do this. On the other hand, I have hundred students. And so it's, it's a little hard to structure peer review in a class of that size. But if the students are getting advice on like the outline, the flow, the components of their infographics, they're still going to need feedback, right? Because again, expert use requires expertise. And so as they're developing expertise in the design of infographics, they're going to need feedback on their work, even if that work is informed by uh, a tool like AI. I'm also going to ask students to document and reflect on their use of AI. So again, keeping that open conversation with students about this. And finally, like John Warner said, I need to go back and look at my rubric. There may be some stuff that is just not worth allocating points to anymore because the AI can pretty much ensure that all students do it well, right? It's changing that average a little bit. So that's my set of decisions. Your set of decisions may be very different, but I think there's a process here that we can all follow that's super helpful. And I'll, I'll kind of end with this. Why does the assignment make sense for this course? I think you need to have a good answer to that question. Why is it useful? Um, why, how does it prepare students for something useful in their professional careers? What are the specific learning objectives? You may not have 16 of them like I did, but what are the learning objectives that you have? These questions help you get a good sense of your assignment. Then you can dig into how AI tools might intersect with that assignment. And this is where you might have to play around with a few different tools and see what they can do. Spend an hour kind of reading about AI tools and experimenting. Then now you can kind of match. Here's my assignment and why it's important. Here's what AI can do. Where might AI undercut the goals of this assignment and how can I mitigate it? And then where might AI enhance the assignment and where would students need help figuring that out? And that's how you start changing the assignment um, to really work in light of these tools. And I'll, I'll add one more. This is really from Anna Mills, who's done a lot of writing on, on AI and writing in particular. How can you make the assignment more meaningful for students or support them more in the work? The more authentic, the assignment is, the more supported the students are, the less likely they'll try to shortcut it, right? The more they'll be invested and try to get something out of it. So I think with that, we have a little time left for Q&A, Brad. We do. As always, we're running short on time, which just gives me so much pain because I, I, I know we could keep this conversation going. Um, we're going to um, go ahead and, and uh, launch a poll uh, and then carry on this conversation uh, here. Um, so if... if um, you uh, would like to give us feedback. We read these responses and seek to always improve this experience for you. Uh, so please uh, take some time to do that. Um, if you're already using Top Hat and would like assistance or have questions about the platform, please let us know and we'll follow up. Uh, and if you're new to Top Hat and would like to receive a personalized demo, uh, indicate that and we'll arrange that uh, for you. Um, so thank you all for, uh, for contributing uh, to the, to the uh, improvement of this experience. So uh, we've just got a few minutes left, Eric. I, I think one of the questions, one of the themes that's come through both the chat and uh, through a number of questions is, is around this ethical use uh, kind of concern. So let me see if I can bundle them into, into a question here. Um, um, one is around how, how we ourselves think through this or, or work with our students to think through the ethical use of these technologies. Midjourney in particular has gotten a lot of attention for, for leveraging copyrighted materials. So IP is one dimension of, of the concerns that might arise. Um, but um, also uh, issues of security and privacy um, and the equity gap that you mentioned and, and the potential for um, disparity that might uh, creep into your use of AI because some students may go ahead and pay for the, the highest end version of what you're trying to uh, help students use. So how do, you, how do you recommend thinking through these things? I know that's a lot. Sure. You've got about yeah, two Yeah, that's a whole, yeah, I've got a few minutes. We can solve those problems. Um, I do think there's several different big questions or areas that you mentioned there. And I do think that we need to be having good conversations about this. We need to be reading and writing about this. Um, we need to be uh, reflecting on kind of our own standing within some of these ethical areas. Um, I do think, uh, you know, um, 
let me start with the uh, inequity thing, right? Um, well, so at Mississippi, like I said, we have a site license for Microsoft products, which gives us access to Microsoft Copilot, which is a pretty good version of one of these tools. Also with that site license, we have certain protections in place legally around student privacy, right? That that would already existed several years ago, right? When we signed the license as a, as a campus. And so that would cover the use of, you know, because you got to think about if students are sending information, they're sending their essay up to ChatGPT for feedback, right? Like there's a whole kind of ethical uh, set of ethical questions with that, right? What is ChatGPT, the company going to do with that information? Um, can they identify that student and associate them with your course? So now we have FERPA problems here. Um, it took us 55 minutes to get to FERPA. I like to mark that. H how long does it take to talk about FERPA? Um, so um, some of that can perhaps be resolved at the institutional level, right? So if you've got a contract with a vendor like that as an institution, you may have certain safeguards in place that come with that contract. And so as these tools become more ubiquitous, I think it's important to think about institutionally, right? How do we solve some of these problems? And so, um, and I say that maybe that's a little unempowering for individual instructors, right? But but some of these problems are really hard to solve, right? And we, we shouldn't, as an individual faculty member, have to solve them all ourselves, right? Like we should get some help from our institutions kind of thinking through some of these things. Um, the other thing that I'll mention here is that a lot of these AI technologies are going to be integrated alongside other things, right? Not unlike Top Hat has Ace, right? As an AI kind of assistant that plays in it. If you're using Microsoft products now, like, I mean, I go to LinkedIn and it wants to help me write my post with AI, right? So like, there's going to be a lot of access to certain forms of AI pretty much everywhere. Um, gosh, I wish I could answer the ethical dilemmas here in a minute, but um, I will say that, um, so I mentioned Perry Fasihi, who teaches at Boston University. Um, she's been writing some really thoughtful stuff about her experiments with AI and her teaching. She actually gives her students an opt out on every assignment. Let me take that back. One of her courses is explicitly about AI and students have to use AI tools on a regular basis. That was clear on day one. Her writing course, she's experimenting with the use of AI and her students have an opt out on every assignment to say, I'm not gonna use AI for this. And, and they, they can explain their reasons or not, right? Um, and so I think that's something that we need to, that model we need to think about, right? I don't let my engineering students not use Excel, right? Like, cause they don't like Microsoft, right? I'm sorry, but we need to use this tool. But if I'm using this tool in the service of some other set of learning objectives, I might want to think about how can I give my students some options? So at least if they have some ethical objections, they have a way out and we have an opportunity to talk about what some of those ethical questions might be. Because you and I could talk about mid-journey and copyright infringement for an hour and a half, right? That's but right. That's it's right. probably our students that we need to be having that conversation with. Absolutely. I think that's probably the best advice is to really engage our students in a co-exploration and maybe a co-setting of norms around the complexity here uh, so that everyone, or the opt-out strategy, I think it's a really effective way to allow for individual uh, navigation of that space. Um, uh, I know you have some uh, uh, final thoughts here, so uh, why don't you share uh, your, your parting thoughts? Yeah, this was a comment made by a, a participant in a webinar I did a few months ago, and I just think it's really powerful. Uh, Mark Klein from Methodist University said, do we want our students to be able to ethically and skillfully use these tools, <clears throat> which will be required in the work environment, or wait for them to learn on the job where they may not have emphasis placed on skillful and ethical use of them? And so I think that's a nice call to us as educators to prepare our students to use these tools skillfully and ethically. So thank you for having me here. Well, Derek, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, having you with us. Uh, please join me in thanking Derek, who uh, is also battling a cold. So you did, thank you uh, for, for really stepping up. Uh, Sorry for the coffee. Uh, this has been fantastic and we really could keep this conversation going. Um, if you haven't had the chance to read his intentional tech, I'd encourage you to pick up a copy. And if you're looking to make the most of your commute, your time at the gym or walking the dog, please do check out the Intentional Teaching Podcast. Uh, it really is a treasure trove of insights and inspiration from fellow educators. 
Uh, and in fact, I understand that our own uh, Dr. Shivanti Kanthetti, uh, who is a Top Hat Educator Award winner, uh, has been on the podcast recorded and will be, uh, or is going to be uh, recorded. And, and that I have is- interviewed her and she'll be in an upcoming episode. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, really looking forward to that. Um, again, uh, Derek, thank you so much. And thank all of you for choosing to spend your time with us. Until next time, wishing you a successful finish to your semester and the best of luck navigating uh, this extremely dynamic time we're in. Take care.